Okay, fantastic. Well, Sam, here we are, man. Um, we've talked about this for a little while. Glad that we could finally, finally make it happen, bro. Um, today, we're going to be speaking about something, um, something interesting. And perhaps for many people, they wouldn't have had the privilege of hearing a perspective that we're going to be discussing today. And basically, what we're going to be talking about is sort of how critical theory has influenced different parts of the world. Um, how it has perhaps been a prevalent idea um, in, for example, an African context through ideas such as post-colonialism. So we just want to have a good discussion around this. Um, and um, as we get started, Sam, I just, I just, I just want to, I just want us to speak a little bit about why we think this is this is necessary to to talk about. Um, I know you've been writing about you know, critical race theory for a little while. You, you mentioned that you've been developing a curriculum on critical race theory. Um, you blog about it um, week in, week out. You tweet about it. Uh, point is, you're a very active, prominent voice speaking out against um, some of these ideologies. Um, why, why, is it, why are these things a concern to you? And why is the topic that we're discussing tonight something that you think is necessary to discuss? Um, well, we've seen within the church how these ideas have been influencing a number of people that we were formerly influenced by. A lot of uh, evangelical leaders have embraced critical race theory. And, um, you know, uh, um, we also see, you know, we, I, I, we've, you know, I, I have many friendships and that have been destroyed by these very issues. And I know marriages that are um, in danger because of these issues. Um, I've seen many churches being divided uh, because of these, uh, these issues. And then also the world is talking about this. Um, everywhere, you cannot, you cannot go to work, you cannot go to a school, you cannot go to a family gathering, you can't go anywhere where you wouldn't see um, these ideas being either pushed or discussed um, in any form. Um, therefore, as people who are called to be the light of the world, who are called to be the salt of the earth, who are called to be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in us, we need to understand these things very clearly so that we can share um, what Christ says about the, these things and uh, we can um, um, defend biblical theology, defend the hope that is in us. And also when people who are being destroyed by this, people whose souls are being destroyed by this um, as um, we can we can witness to them when we understand where uh, they're coming from. Yeah. So that is why we're addressing the, these issues. At least that's what I would say to that mm. discussion. That's really good. Yeah, sure. So yeah, the reason I thought this was important was really a twofold reason. The first reason is um, I think there are people in the West who might be surprised to know that uh, issues to do with social justice and critical theory is more widespread. It, it hasn't just influence or is just influencing the United States or Canada or uh, parts of Europe. Um, this, is, this is a widespread problem. This is something that even in Africa we have to deal with. Um, and the second reason why I think this is critical to deal with is because I think there are people here in Africa who think these are uniquely Western problems, uh, problems that don't really involve us. Um, and I'm, I, I love to make the, I think it's necessary to make the bold assertion that many of the countries um, that are in Africa and in other parts of the world, specifically developing countries who were previously colonized, um, have actually been built on a social justice premise. Um, much of the way economics and politics are done is from a social justice worldview. Um, it has the influence of uh, critical theory or, or Marxism and that's why I think this is this is necessary to um, to speak about. And I think I think it'll be ben beneficial for, uh, to people on um, different sides of the ocean, all around the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. So yes, Sam. Um, um, so I know I've already seen a few a few comments um, that that are speaking of uh, asking us for definitions, and that is something that we're actually going to begin with. Um, so we just want to define, uh, define a few terms um, before, we, um, before we get into the meat of what we're going to discuss. 
And the first thing I want us to, to define, Sam, is critical theory. Um, what is critical theory? Um, so Sam, do you want to just kick us off on that and give us an understanding of um, how you define critical theory? And if you so wish, go into defining critical race theory as well. Okay. Um, it's hard to describe these issues without describing ideas that come before that. But generally, well, yeah, I'll have to start with a, a different theory before I explain what critical theory is and then explain what critical race theory is. So essentially, critical theory comes from um, something um, developed by Marx called conflict theory. And conflict theory is really the foundation of Marxism. Um, and, and eventually, as we'll get into later on, postmodernism. Conflict theory basically suggests at a very basic level um, is saying that society um, in different degrees, which we'll get to later on as well too, is made up of the oppressor and the oppressed. I'm sure you hear that many, many times, but really it just means that you have a privileged or oppressive group in, in a economic sense or a class sense, it would be, especially in the original sense, it would be the proletariat and then the, op the oppressed, the underprivileged would be, in a, again, the class sense or economic sense, it would be the poor or the proletariat. Mm -hmm. So Marx and, um, you know, uh, and um, Marx and then Marxist um, would say that that's what society is made up of and that there will always be this conflict between these two groups in different degrees. And the only way, this is a key part as to what I'll, well, what I'll mention when it comes to critical rate, critical theory, the key thing is, is that that this conflict will exist until the oppressed group has consciousness or becomes woke to their own oppression, because as we'll deal with as well too, there is something called hegemony, uh, which is the uh, oppressive influence that the oppressors have over the oppressed, where they basically manipulate them and deceive them to thinking that what they think is the norm, what they think is right, what they think is true, is really just um, uh, oppressive ideas from the, um, the privileged group to oppress the, um, the oppressed. So why do I have to say that before critical, critical theory? Well, essentially, critical, critical theory came out of the 1920s and 1930s. And by that time, you had the Marxists being very disappointed because they realized that communist Russia, the Soviet Union, were, were not really implementing the kind of communism or communist state that they promised they would have, where they were still oppressive. Now, that's of course because Marxist ideas will never work. Um, they're evil and they will never work. But so they, they wanted to ex explain why is it that the oppressed group in even in communist um, Russia or Soviet Union and across the world were not yet conscious of their oppression. So then they said, well, critical theory, the main thing, uh, which I already mentioned before, borrowing from, uh, and, um, uh, from Antonio uh, Gramsci. Is it Antonio? I'm forgetting his first name. I always say Gramsci. I forget yeah, I think, I think it is Antonio Gramsci. You're good. Yeah. Yeah, where it just talks about how there is a cultural hegemony, not just a, not just a um, economic um, hegemony or influence against the poor, but there's a cultural hegemony. There's all these ideas, uh, not just based on the economy, but based on religion, based on, um, again, philosophy, everything you can think about is that the oppressed is using this to influence, uh, thank you very much, uh, to influence uh, for those of you who maybe who are watching the recording, I just saw a nice, a, a, com a, a kind comment in the chat. Um, and I'm arrogant enough that I will stop my thought just so that I can talk about that. <laughs> no, <laughs> but no. Um, so that is, um, no, I've lost my train of thought. It's <laughs> you're so, okay, you're so kind. In different ways, uh, through the legal system, through ideas, through capitalism, through religion, through a number of things, they're being oppressed and manipulated by white people into um, basically em embracing their own oppression. Um, so that's generally what critical race theory is. That's what critical theory is. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, 
that's really good, man. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's necessary to uh, necessary to define that. Um, so I think very connected to that idea is what we're going to be talking about very specifically tonight, which is uh, post-colonial theory. Um, and just to kind of give people a, a brief definition, and uh, Sam, you can jump in here whenever you you want to want to add something. So basically, post-colonial post-colonialism is the idea that non-Western countries uh, must de deconstruct the West by throwing off ideas. Um, and influences that are perceived to have perpetrated colonialism that came from the Western world. So basically this is an attempt to throw off anything that's Western because it's, it, it's perceived to be oppressive of non-Western countries. Um, so yeah, this is, a, this, is a, this is a prevalent idea in Africa. I'm not sure many, um, many people would be aware of it, but I think um, in, areas of academia, um, this is certainly something that many people would come across. Um, and it's been popularized by, by different people in, in different parts of the world as well. I think one of the, um, the well-known uh, perpetrators of this idea is a man who goes by the name of Franz Fanon. Um, and uh, he, I think he's originally from, from the Caribbean. Um, and he had um, some interesting experiences um, working um, with with Algerian refugees, and that sort of started his um, his post-colonial ideas, which became very popular. Um, in in this part of the world, um, you had uh, you had leaders like Kwame Nkrumah, who did a lot to uh, to push uh, post-colonial theory. Um, and many, many people who would be considered freedom fighters, especially in Africa, uh, would have pushed post-colonial theory. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a prevalent idea that still very much fits, fits into the, uh, the critical theory framework of society being built um, on the premise that there's always an oppressed group and an oppressive group. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, brother. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, again, I appreciate what you just said. Just to add to that, let's remember that postmodernism um, is really saying that the West is built on oppressive ideas. Mm -hmm. So the West is built to oppress certain groups. Basically, the idea is, it, as, as many people are, are familiar with now through critical race theory, it is built by white men for white men. That's generally what it is. Also, it deals with, and then in their mind, that these white men have built ideas and are claiming, that, that they claim are rational, that, that they claim are truth. But as I was saying to you before, remember I was saying that the, the, in, in critical race theory or in critical theory, um, the, the, the belief is, is that the, op the oppressors are using their hegemony, they're using power knowledge, they're using ideas to manipulate the oppressed into thinking what is actually oppressive is good and right, mm -hmm. right? So in the same way, um, when it comes to the uh, post-colonial context, what they're really saying is the Western world has deceived Africans into pursuing what they think is good and true for Africa is good, but really is oppressive ideas from the West. Mm -hmm. So something like capitalism, something like Christianity, especially, um, democracy, all those things in, in post-colonial theory are oppressive ideas from the West that are colonizing Africans into thinking is good for Africans when it's really not. Which is why, as you mentioned before, a lot of the freedom, a lot of the freedom fighters were, um, were really evil men and dictators and yeah. oppressive people. I know we'll get into that with maybe yeah. um, more but but all these guys they were trying to say well through pan-africanism i think someone mentioned that i think charles mentioned it pan-africanism is the product of post-colonial thinking mm -hmm. uh, which was developed by um ghana's for, ghana's first um president kwame nkrumah who was a communist and made ghana into a communist regime and pan-africanism basically says that the western world is hostile against africans and will always be not just Africans, but also 
what, what they would call the diaspora, right? That, um, um, but, you know, Africans, like Black Americans in their mind, or Black, Black Canadians, uh, Black uh, British people, Black Australians, Black people from around the world, that all Black people in the continent or outside of the continent need to join together to work together for their mind um, the greater good of all Africans because the West is always going to be hostile against Black people. So Black people need to now, need to now come together, um, you know, through communist ideas um, to protect themselves. That's generally what Pan-Africanism is. But as I've mentioned, it comes directly from post-colonial thinking or really post-modernism. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, that's really good, Sam. Um, I, think that's, I think that's really good. And uh, I think you see, uh, you, you see great attempts to sort of decolonize as, as people like to, to call it, from Western ideas, um, from things that are considered Western constructs. So in this part of the world, uh, things like capitalism are frowned on. Um, things like, th thing, anything that has, to, that looks like it's come from the West, even something like Christianity um, is, is looked down on because it's seen to be uh, a weapon that was used to perpetrate colonialism, to, to perpetrate uh, to perpetrate uh, oppression is that Kwame Nkrumah's idea of Pan-Africanism was uh, a very contextualized um, attempt to um, to basically fend off uh, Western ideas, um, to fend off uh, the possibility of Africa being colonized once again. So it's 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 really a contextualized form of globalism, which is said to be, I suppose, uh, an attempt to liberate um, uh, Africans or liberate any uh, oppressed groups from from oppression. And this is this is a common idea from those who hold to a, a critical theory worldview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. So Sam, the next thing I was hoping we could we could jump into. Um, is, is just speaking about some of the consequences of, of this ideology. So we've kind of defined what it is. We've kind of spoken about where it's, it's come from and uh, some of the people who've popularized it. Um, but what's, what are some of the consequences of, of holding to um, a, 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 of, of post-colonialism or holding to a worldview that is essentially Marxist? Yeah. We both, but um, since I'm assuming everyone here is a Christian, um, uh, this is the crucial, crucial point that there is a growing hostility against Christianity in Africa based on post-colonial thinking. Mm. Um, I'm sure we've all encountered it. You know, I've seen it here in Canada. I've seen it uh, with Black Americans and especially in Africa where this idea that Christianity, it is a white man's religion meant to oppress black people. Right. Um, and that's because right. Christianity, not completely, but at least modern Christianity in, um, in Africa um, came out, came after the, or through the slave trade and in colonialism. So because of that, um, at least in part because of that, a lot of Africans have adopted the belief uh, the post-colonialist belief that Christianity is inherently oppressive uh, because it's tied to the white oppressor in their mind. Yeah. Um, well, what's the consequence? It's leading to um, uh, a lot of a lot of intellectual uh, Africans, or I should say, academic Africans, um, using that as a basis to reject um, the, the the work of the gospel in Africa. Uh, I know um, I know some friends who are in. Uh, missions and you be not you necessarily next. I know you're familiar with this stuff, but sure. many people people would be surprised to hear how some of the biggest pushback they're receiving in Africa when they're preaching the gospel is yeah. that they are white oppressors coming into Africa to oppress uh, black people again in a different way, yeah. um, and that's the issue that we're having here. So there are many other issues which I can we can get into, but. At a fundamental level, because of these ideas, it is harming. Satan is using it 
to try to stop the work of the gospel in Africa. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think that's a I think that's a phenomenal point. Um, um, you're right. I think there are a few people who are on this call who um, would testify to this. Uh, but in Africa, you see this. You see people having very cold and hardened hearts uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ because uh, they they associate that with colonialism. They associate that with um, with oppression, um, and so they sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, um, and want nothing to do with Christianity as well. So I think one of the, one of the great consequences of, uh, of, of buying into post-colonial theory is that it's, it's very anti-God. And that kind of shows you um, some of its roots. Critical theory is, is fundamentally grounded in, uh, in atheism. You have to dismiss God from, um, from everything in order for these, for these ideologies to, uh, to hold water. Um, and, and, and let's get, and I think it's important to, to make, this, make this point. And Sam, you alluded to this, and I think we might be getting into perhaps one of the second consequences of, of post-colonial theory. Um, fundamentally, when, when people started to adopt some of these ideas, specifically in Africa, I, I'm not convinced that freedom was their greatest desire. Um, I, I, I believe that power was their greatest desire. Um, it, it really wasn't about freedom. It really wasn't about a real emancipation. It was about power and wanting to get the, uh, take the reins of power, which is why many of the countries who um, uh, threw off the shackles of colonialism and became independent states uh, became communist states. Uh, they embraced communism and a, a sort of hard communism. Um, several African leaders had one party states. I'll speak about the country that I live in, Zambia, where Kenneth Kaunda uh, essentially set up a one party rule uh, for a little while. Um, eventually that did change, um, but this was, this was a trend. And so what you see is how communism is what uh, replaced colonialism and people continue to suffer, uh, but people didn't really consider it uh, a real kind of suffering or a real kind of oppression because it wasn't an oppression from another group. It wasn't an oppression from um, a Western society or Western country. Um, and, and, this is, and this is important to note because uh, post-colonialism is not really about freedom. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an attempt to grab power. Um, it's an attempt to, to promote uh, so-called egalitarian ideals, but only for the sake of those who um, really are interested in, in grabbing power. Um, Sam, I don't know if that's something you want to speak into, brother. Go for it. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I want to quote a critical race theorist to show that this is really all about power. Ibrahim Kendi, as many people know, um, he in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, he says this, that um, I think it's, he says the remedy um, for, um, no, I think he said, yeah, sorry. It says that um, future, no, sorry, I'm getting myself confused here. It says present um, discrimination needs present discrimination and present discrimination needs future, dis sorry, future discrimination. What is he saying there? He said, since white people, that's what he would say anyways, but since white people discriminated against, sorry, I'm so down. <clears throat> Since white people discriminated against black people in the past, therefore, black people now need to discriminate against white people. This is word for word what he said in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. I think if you, if you, read, if you go to my, uh, my blog and you search for How to Be a Racist, that was, that's my title for my book review of uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibrahim Kendi, you will see those words. Why do I say that? Well, it's because you're right, Lennox, that this is all about power. This is not about justice. It's not about freedom. They call themselves freedom fighters, but they're not freedom fighters. It's all about power. See, it might shock people to hear this. The first post-colonial leader in Africa, the first Pan-Africanist in Africa, 
the most influential in Africa still to this day. If you go to any course on Pan-Africanism, post-colonial theory, um, you will hear his name. You already mentioned it, Kwame Nkrumah. He is, uh, many of you might know that I'm from Ghana. Uh, he is Ghana's first president. Ghana is the first sub-Saharan um, nation in Africa to gain independence. Just to give you a, a, a quick story about Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah was part of what we in Ghana call the big six. These are basically the national heroes that ended up um, removing Britain essentially, um, you know, through like removing colonialism from, from, uh, from Ghana. When he, well, when he, be, when he ended up becoming president, immediately the other five of the big six basically turned against him because they learned very quickly this man was all about power. Well, Ghana was the first sub-Saharan country to become in Africa to become, uh, uh, you know, free from uh, from colonialism. But we also became the first African nation to be communist because he was a communist, and the other five did not quite realize that he was a communist. They thought he was strictly about removing the colonial powers, Britain ended up establishing pan-Africanism and really communism into these nations where they were oppressing their people, where they were murdering their own people, where they were murdering their political rivals, where they were, um, where they were dictators. Because again, capitalism, democracy are all Western ideas. And to go back to the Christian issue here, Kwame Nkrumah said there is no God but Kwame Nkrumah. Like they were all over Ghana. My mom was a young child. She remembers where you would find, you would see posters of Kwame Nkrumah saying there is no God but himself. That at school they had to sing. They were forced to sing songs worshiping Kwame Nkrumah because um, post-colonial thinking is radically anti-Christian. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think that's, I think that's such an important thing to, to note, Sam, because um, I think as Christians, it's easy for us to, to think these aren't dangerous ideas, um, that post post-colonial theory is this harmless thing that's all about freedom, um, but it's essentially anti-God. Um, and you know what tyrants don't like? Tyrants don't like Christianity. Tyrants don't like anything that would um, cut them at the legs and level them. Uh, tyrants don't like to bow down to anything but themselves. Um, and uh, this is something that should be a great concern to us um, as, as, as Christians specifically. Um, Post-colonial theory is not a tame ideology. It is something that is designed to, um, to corrupt. It's, it's something that's designed to destroy. Um, and it has to. Um, and in that regard, you, you saw this after, after um, you know, colonial powers left Africa, communist states were established, um, African economies tanked, absolutely tanked. Um, I'll give a very specific example of uh, Robert Mugabe and, and what he did in Zimbabwe. He, um, he, he assumed power in Zimbabwe, uh, kicked out anyone who was a white farmer in Zimbabwe, uh, which meant the economy was, you know, radically destroyed almost instantaneously. Uh, and year after year, things just got worse and worse. I know we've got friends from Zimbabwe who are um, who, who are in this in this meeting right now, who who can testify to what I'm saying. Um, yeah. And and this was this was a common pattern in Zambia as well. I think towards the end of Kenneth Kaunda's reign, uh, you know, people were lining up for bread. People were essentially just fed up with him, um, and that's that's the inevitable thing. Uh, with communism. You see what's happening in Cuba now. People are rioting because they've, they've had enough, essentially, of communism. Um, the, the, and and what, what Castro was advocating in Cuba well, was justice. Um, he did it all in the name of justice, uh, all in the name of freedom, all in the name of emancipation. And that's what all these so-called freedom fighters do. Um, they, they talk a big game, um, but, but at the end of the day, it's really about, about justice. Um, which is something I find interesting, Sam. Um, you know, in critical race theory, you get this idea of, well, you get people who are called race hustlers. And basically, these are the perpetrators of the idea of systemic racism. Um, and 
they're often the, the biggest beneficiaries of spearing this kind of propaganda because it comes with a lot of money. Um, so uh, same thing in Africa. Some of these guys who are so-called freedom fighters, um, the, these guys who assume power um, are deeply corrupt, um, steal a ton of money, <laughs> build themselves mansions all over the place with offshore accounts, living the life while, they're, while their people suffer. Um, and that's a yeah. common trend you see um, in almost every communist society that's been, that's been um, established. And so it's important to note that post-colonialism is a sort of precursor to, to communism um, and has fundamentally wrecked countries um, in, in, in vast ways. Well, I mean, uh, and some might be surprised to hear that, but is the same way every scholar of postmodernism will tell you that every postmodernist is a communist. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, so Foucault, um, uh, Derrida, um, Lyotard, all those guys, like the, the three um, fathers of postmodernism, they were all communist. Yeah. And since postcolonial uh, theory comes from postmodernists, well, they're all communists too. So many may not know this, but every single freedom fighter who became an African leader. When I say every, I am not like exaggerating. Yeah. Every single one is a communist. Um, Idi Amin, um, I'm forgetting how to pronounce, um, is it Kwanda? I'm forgetting how to say uh, your, uh, I always yeah. forget, Zambian. Uh, Kaunda. Kaunda, yeah, communist. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah, communist. Um, Mugabe, communist. Um, uh, who else? Uh, I'm forgetting. Um, oh, the man, the Libya, Libya, uh, very influenced uh, by Gaddafi. Kuma. He just Gaddafi, Gaddafi, communist. It might shock Julius exactly. There you go. Uh, I was, I, I was, is it Nyerere? Is that how you say yeah. or Nyerere? Nyerere, yeah, yeah. Nyerere. yeah. He's also a communist. All these guys are communist. Yep. So, um, all these, these ideas are linked. So you're completely right to say that it's a precursor to communism. One more thing, you mentioned Cuba. So many people were surprised when Black Lives Matter sided with um, the communist regime than the communist people. I, I can't say I laugh because it's not funny, but I was like, how could you like, they, people don't realize the connection here. Yeah. Black Lives Matter is a self-admitted post-colonial organization. Mm. They are pan-Africanist. Mm. They are post-modernist. They are critical race theorists. They're critical theorists. All stuff is linked. Yep. They are pro-communism. They're pro the Cuba regime. Mm. And I'll go as far as saying this, they're also anti the Cuban people. And you can tell from their, from their statement against uh, a statement on Cuba. Why? Remember, post-colonial thinking or post-colonialism teaches not only um, that um, that the West is is influencing Africa to adopt oppressive ideas, but it teaches that you have something called the colonized mind, mm. very popularized by um, I always forget his name. Is it Fannin Fritz or is it Fritz Fannin? I always forget. Uh, um, Franz Fannin. But mm -hmm. Franz Fannin. Yeah. Wow. I even butchered it. Yeah. But the idea is this, that African individuals or basically non-Western individuals, non-European white individuals have a colonized mind and they have to decolonize their thinking. I'm sure many of you guys have heard that term. Decolonize means that you need to stop thinking the way in their mind the West has influenced them oppressively to think. So in the case of the Cuban people, Black Lives Matter would believe the reason why you saw the Cuban people holding American flags isn't because they really love liberty and justice. It's because they've been colonized through culture and education or through media by the Western or American people, which is why they don't see, again, this is what Black Lives Matter or post-colonial leaders would think that's why the Cuban people do not see what's in front of them. They don't see how good they have it. They have free health care. They have, you know, all you know, free health care. They have all these yeah. things. And yet so colonized that they prefer America over Cuba. 
That's what they would think. That's all because, again, of post-colonialism or post-colonial theory. Mm. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. Even, sorry. Even even more even more on that. There's a book called I think The Struggle of Freedom by Angela Davis, who is also a noted Black feminist, post-colonial um, leader, uh, critical race theorist. And in her book, she says that what's what's happening in Israel and Palestine or what's happening in Israel with the Palestinian people is identical yeah. in her mind to yeah. what's happening with black Americans uh, in America. Mm. Because mm -hmm. again of colonialism, that in her mind and in other critical race theorists mind, that this is a global issue of yeah. Western thinking uh, uh, oppressing um, certain groups. So yeah. since they believe that Israel and Israel is allies with the West. That Israel then is a colon is is a um, is a colonizer is an oppressive regime, yeah. which is pressing in their mind the priv the underprivileged people there, which is the Palestinian people. So it's identical in their mind to what's happening in America, what's happening in Canada, what's happening in the UK. All of that is all intertwined. So yeah. this is a global issue that we need to absolutely understand and reject. Mm, absolutely. Um, and I think another example that comes to mind, brother, is um, in 2015, uh, there was a popular movement in South Africa called Roads Must Fall. Um, and essentially it was really about, uh, you know, tarnishing the image of um, an English bus a businessman named Cecil Rhodes, uh, Cecil John Rhodes. Um, Interestingly enough, Zambia was was uh, Zambia's previous name was Northern Rhodesia, and I actually believe that yeah. name uh, came from Cecil Rhodes. Zimbabwe was was Southern Rhodesia, um, and uh, it was it was a huge movement, and it, it started in South Africa, but it became a worldwide phenomenon. It became it, it became a, a hashtag of sorts, um, and the, the popular thing that was being advocated then um, w was basically the idea that. Um, even education needs to be decolonized. Um, and, and so you're right when you're actually, when you take it back to postmodernism, because uh, basically the thought there is that everything that you could possibly know um, without decolonizing will perpetrate a perpetual oppression from the Western world, right? And therefore, uh, you must radically decolonize education. Um, by channeling even things like African spirits, for example, which is another big problem with this whole post-colonialism post thing, because it's it's perpetrated African traditional religion um, as a as a common ideology and as a common practice, unbridled and unchallenged. Um, many practices that um, you know are, are, are to just fly, and I, I'd even say even in the church, I think there are many things that even the church have been allowed. Because we see, you know, things that are, you know, traditional in African sense as sacred now, and things that had been suppressed when colonialism uh, was prevalent. And so you want to sort of uh, keep these um, old traditions that are, that's basically animism. It's, it's you know, the worship of yeah. spirits, the worship of, of ancestors. It's, it's superstition, essentially. Um, and that becomes the prevalent worldview. Um, and embracing that sort of thinking is a form of decolonization. Um, so we see the degree to which um, this has this has even affected academia. You see the, uh, the degree to which it's affected the church. Um, the church is compromised. The church um, is undiscerning about these things because we sort of read the Bible <laughs> through the lenses of the culture. Uh, rather than the other way around, and and I think that has been that has been catastrophic, Sam. It, it, it absolutely has. Um, and in a society like an African society specifically, Sam, um, you also get a lot of uh, uh, push from nonprofits. Um, NGOs are a very big thing in this part of the world. <laughs> um, African states are largely run by by communists and. Uh, non-profits, you know, from, from a policy level, that is. Um, and so uh, non-profits push their social justice, um, and you, you see things like African feminism becoming very prominent. Um, you, you see 
um, all kinds of things, even things like abortion. Um, and it's all in the name of it's all in the name of justice. Um, it's it's all the name of uh, throwing off uh, colonial oppression, historic colonial oppression, um, and even uh, what, what they call neo-colonialism, which um, w- which is a very interesting idea. Um, but it, it's it's it basically touches on the idea that there's still ideas that were yet to throw off um, mm-hmm. that, that 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 the West still thrusts down our throats in a in a way to control us. Um, so mm-hmm. it's. Um, it's it's a big issue that I think really does does need to be challenged, um, and, and and on that note, Sam, um, l- l- let's speak a little bit about how Christians and the church and spe- the church specifically ought to respond to respond to these things. Um, we've spoken a lot about um, what post colonialism is, um, the problem with post colonialism, the consequences of post colonialism, um, but what should our response be? to post-colonialism as Christians. Before I mention that, um, I, you, you mentioned NGOs. I'm not sure if everyone will know what NGOs are, so can yeah. you please um, explain what that is? That's a great question. So basically NGO means a non-governmental organization. That's, um, um, that, that's what it is in full. Um, so they, they run as non-profits um, and many, many NGOs um, are set up as community development agents um, who you know work in, in, in various parts of Africa, um, sometimes rural areas as well, um, trying to seek development. Uh, but what's ended up happening is um, they've also been pushing a big social justice narrative um, on, 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 on many, many, many levels. Um, so as I, as I alluded to before, um, they've been big advocates of things like African feminism. Um, They've even been big advocates of, of state totalitarianism, um, simply because governments are uh, basically agents that help these NGOs carry out their agendas. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of money in this industry, uh, a lot of money. And yes, you're right, Emmanuel, homosexuality is also something on, on their agenda. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think NGOs in Africa, it's, it's a billion dollar industry, essentially. Yeah. Um, so once again, you need to talk about race hustlers. These are people who perpetrate this post-colonial thing, and I like to call them poverty hustlers. <laughs> In the name of poverty, um, they they perpetrate uh, some of this some of this garbage, and it's yeah. it's it's really been catastrophic. Oh, yeah. and, and, and on that and on that note, Sam, it's interesting because many of these NGOs get their funding from the Western world, um, and if you see how they sort of set up their marketing. Um, it's it's very specifically designed to exploit white guilt, <laughs> um, and and so you know you, you sort of sell this idea that you can uh, you know divest of your white guilt by helping a black starving child in Africa. Um, it's 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 a whole scheme that has been very very uh, detrimental to, to to the African economy, just to African society, to African culture at large. Um, so yeah, I guess that's that's a little bit on that side. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, some people. Um, I think it was uh, Joe, Joe, uh, Joe Shoko and Emmanuel. I'm not going to try and butcher that last name there. Uh, I want to, but I won't try. Uh, but Emmanuel and Joe in the comment section have been uh, talking about the inconsistencies of postcolonialism, mm. and you know, I you know, so they've mentioned how. You know, and yet, you know, although although Africans, um, so I think yeah, Joe says that yeah, isn't it funny that many Africans would yeah. reject Western ideologies, but no one refused technology or even even the education that is taught in schools, because yeah. most of it comes from a Western perspective. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm so glad that he mentioned that, and yeah. then um, I, I think uh, Joe mentions how yeah, phones, cars, internet, books, yeah. homosexuality, all those things. Well, in the same way that you know, people often say the most capitalist people in the world are communist leaders right <laughs> yeah that, you know that you you see that you know communist leaders are so wealthy yeah. they love money they, they claim they're against capital and all that stuff but they love money it's the idea of capitalism for me just not for you well in the same way with post-colonialism a lot of these guys that claim to be anti 
you know, Western ideology, they're not really against the West. Mm -hmm. That's not what they are. No, no. They yeah. love the West, yeah. right? Well, at least some things about the West. The problem is it's not really about loving, um, it's not really about hating the West. It's yeah. about hating justice. That's the issue here. They hate justice. Let's face it. Postmodernists would claim that there's cultural relativism and there's no such thing as real justice or real truth, all that. That's junk, right? It's a way to, it's, it's a way to justify evil. Nevertheless, look, as a Ghanaian, mm. as an African, I can tell you the people that have the group, you know, part of the world that has the best form of justice, even though it's changing, sadly, to the, for, the, for the worse, not for the better, mm. the West still has the best system. That's why... Almost every African that I know, if they if if they can have all their family, all of them together coming to the West, they're going to choose the West over Africa. We all know that for for several reasons. Why? Well, it's because the West has, uh, at least in the beginning, they have biblical foundations that leads to it being a truly uh, a justice that's truly committed. Uh, sorry, a society that's committed to justice. So, which is why all these guys would claim. They are being uh, all the, all these guys would claim they are uh, anti-West, but yet they embraced Western thinking on homosexuality yeah. or abortion, right? So they're not really against the West; they're just really against injustice. Yeah. Uh, but going back to uh, the question that you asked me about, how should we think about this? Mm. Well, it's uh, as Christians, it's really imperative that we our ideas are shaped, as you said, by Scripture and not the culture. Amen. The culture is always changing. We're always, if you go with the culture, you're going to be tossed for and fro. You, that is not what you want. Yeah. Um, the same way Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, that's true for the Bible, you know, which is also his, obviously his word. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to commit to the scriptures and understand justice and truth from there. Men are always seeking their own power, right? Um, but let, 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 um, let, what is it? Let God be true and every man prove to be a liar. Um, God is true. God, uh, Christ is the truth. We cannot commit to trying to understand the world from our, con from our cultural context. Um, that is all evil. We need to submit to the word of God and then identify and understand the world around us through what God says. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I love that. Um, and, and one of the things that I'm, I'm very passionate about seeing, Sam, is to see the gospel of Jesus Christ being, being preached um, across this continent, because ultimately that's, that's what's going to transform um, our culture. That's really what's going to transform our society. It's not going to be decolonization. Um, people who push post-colonial theory um, aren't interested, once again, in, in, in people's liberation. Um, the, the real liberation that we need is a liberation from sin, um, is, is a liberation from, uh, f from our depravity in that sense. And that we, we only find that hope in Jesus Christ, um, who, who, who does the perfect work of redeeming sinners uh, to himself. Um, and on that point, Sam, I think when, when we have that perspective, um, I think it changes even how how we how we talk about some of these things like one of the like one of the common arguments that uh you'll hear for post-colonialism is that you know they were real atrocities that that actually happened <laughs> um you look at for example apartheid in 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 south africa um you look at um different kinds of of genocides that happened across across the continent of africa um was there real oppression in those cases? Yes, um, yes, there certainly was. But why? Um, it, it, it's it's because men are sinners, <laughs> right? Um, I think that's something that we need to understand. Um, I think I think one of the fundamental problems with um, with critical theory and its attempts to dismiss God um, is that it sees society as as being perpetually built. Um, on the premise of hierarchies, right? So there's no God. So it's basically up to the guy who's the strongest in the room. Uh, and that's essentially what constructs um, society. Um, and now basically it, it sort of misdiagnoses the biggest problem in this world, um, which, is, which is supposed to be sin. 
And because of misdiagnosis, the problem, you never really get to the solution, which is Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. And so what people really need um, is not more power. <laughs> uh, what people need is, is, um, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What people need um, are biblical truths that um, have been liberating. Um, there is no worldview that communicates true value for human beings. There is no worldview um, that is a greater standard of morality, um, that has a greater standard of ethics. Uh, you will not find that outside of Christianity. Uh, and I think as Christians, if we really understood what the Bible had to say, if we really understood the gospel of Jesus Christ, we wouldn't need post-colonialism. We wouldn't need social justice. We wouldn't need ideologies um, that claim to do things that only Jesus Christ can do, um, that only a Christian worldview uh, can accomplish. Um, and so I think the big question that I challenge many Christians um, with is, you know, is, is the Bible enough? <laughs> um, is God enough? Um, does, is his word sufficient to speak into um, our problems, even our societal problems? Um, is Christ a solution enough uh, to really change the hearts of men and to change the way that we think? Um, I, think I, I think as Christians, we really should be challenged um, to see God's word as sufficient um, for every aspect um, of our lives. Yeah. Hey, I, I appreciate everything you just said. Um, I think all, a lot of this stuff exposes our, um, our lack of love and obedience to the scriptures, mm. uh, where we are always seeking um, to do things according to man's way instead of according to God's way. Yeah. I'll say this, uh, uh, what you said was brilliant, but I have to say this. Um, you're too kind to say this, but I will say it. There's Go someone ahead. in the comment section who's, who's complaining about what we're not saying mm. instead of what we are saying. As someone mentioned, we, this flyer, uh, we, we're addressing this issue. Even then, um, from what I can tell, part of the comment is, well, why don't we address the trauma, the so the so-called trauma that Africans have um, through colonialism and all these things? As you said, there, there were there were oppressions, there were a lot of heinous things. There are, the colonial leaders did a lot of harm. With that said, um, I can guarantee you, um, it's only the some of the post-colonial academics, um, by and large, who are talking about the so-called trauma that Africans have of colonialism. That's actually, ridiculous. that's not true at all. I can yeah. guarantee you the yeah. trauma, um, if there is, if you want to call it that, but it's a trauma that Africans have are the dictators right now who are in Africa murdering their own people. But we don't want to address that. We don't want to address the real issues happening now. We want to complain about what's happened before because then we can justify ourselves and blame the white man instead of blaming ourselves for being sinners mm -hmm. and being just as bad as anybody else. We all fall short of the glory of God. So let's deal, let's deal with the issues. Mm -hmm. um, look, in Ghana right now, you have something, something called Fix the Country. Mm. Not Fix Colonialism, it's Fix the Country. It's a movement because Ghanaians realize that, look, most of the infrastructure and most of the good things we have in Ghana comes from the colonialist. That's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. I'm getting passionate about this because it frustrates me when you have Africans whining about all the things that had happened before, which is bad. But you know what? We've become so anti-Western, where instead of actually trying to be better than the West, we're yeah. we're not. We're yeah. so focused on being against them that is a mess yeah. where people are murdering each other. Yeah. You have you have people who've been in power still murdering their own people. And it's like, yeah, well, you know, at least it's not a colonialist. Come on. So in, in, in Ghana, you have fixed the country and you have the government doing nothing to really fix the country, to improve the country. Corruption is rampant, not from the West, from Africans. Nigeria, we know what happened with end, end the SARS. It's a complaint against the Nigerian government, not the colonialists. Mm. You have all of this stuff going on, but we distract ourselves because we want to complain about the West instead. So again, look, um, you know, colonialism <laughs> was not good. Mm. It was... It, it, it was it was it was bad for 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 Africans, and yet and yet it is not the issue facing Africans today. Absolutely, Look, this may shock, may shock many people. Africa 
as a continent what was actually more wealthy during colonialism than it is or was especially during the, the what we would call you know the greatest time at least the beginning of some would say you know africa's rise with the freedom fighters mm -hmm. it was worse then so yeah. again that's not to justify anything mm -hmm. but let's just deal with the issue that if the colonial leaders are evil well the same is true for africans and as christians look i am i always say this I am an oppressor, and I guess I am oppressed too, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. By what I, what I mean by that is, I fall short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. I am an evil man. I am a sinner, but by the grace of God, I'm a saint. And what I want to call people to is to also recognize that we are all sinners. We yeah. are all capable of oppression. Yeah. Therefore, we need to deal with the heart of the issue, deal with human nature, deal with sin, instead of trying to address systems which yes. don't really solve anything, which right. is why instead of addressing the sin, but mm -hmm. addressing the systems, that's why Africa is still where it is today. And let's just yeah. be honest about exactly. that. Exactly. Uh, Brother Sam, yeah, you have, uh, I think you've hit the nail um, right on the head there. Um, th there's a lot that's overlooked because we think the great evil is, is Western colonization. Right, um, we we can overlook genocides that have what were perpetrated uh, by African <laughs> warlords, right? Uh, but you know, since it wasn't a Western colonial power, um, it's 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 less of an issue to us. Um, or I mean, I, I even look at you know someone historically like like Shaka, um, King Shaka, you know, from the Zulu Kingdom, um, who loved to conquer territory, <laughs> right? Um, uh, th there are tribes in Zambia that are in Zambia because they were running away from Shaka's dominance, right? But we're not going to overlook that. We're not going to. We're going to overlook that. We're not going to talk about how brutal he was in um, in, in in some of his conquests because uh, we always we we love the idea of victimhood, right? And so uh, if if. Uh, you know, if, if we're victims, then we don't have to take responsibility for ourselves. We don't have to take responsibility for our own problems. And as Sam, as you were saying, I think that's been one of the great tragedies in Africa is that Africans have failed to take responsibility for themselves because we're always willing to blame um, someone else. Um, yeah. uh, someone else is always to blame. Um, our issues on our own. It's, it's always got to be some, uh, someone from the West who's, uh, who's to blame. Um, it's, it's, it's never us. Um, and I think what's that, what, what that's created, I, interesting enough, Sam, is that we also then think that the great solution, because we're victims of the West, um, is, is help from the West. You know? <laughs> um, I, I find this very, very ironic, uh, Sam, how in an attempt to, to decolonize, um, in an attempt to throw off Western constructs, and as co communist uh, states are established, eventually these communist states run out of money. And guess who they go to for aid when they run out of money? Western countries, right? Uh, they run to the IMF, they run to the World Bank, they run to whatever country is going to give them give them money. Of course, in more recent times, um, China has become um, a, a, a big player in this, in this, you know, world of aid. Um, but the point is this, is that because we never take responsibility for our problems, uh, we never take responsibility for the solutions either. And I think that has been, um, I think that has been very, uh, very detrimental um, to society. Um, and yes, I mean, Charles, I can, I can understand some of what you're saying. I think there are genuine frustrations. Um, but I think if we're honest, I think we're, we're overlooking um, problems that are closer to home. Um, and, and I think one of the things I heard you reference was just the idea that reformed churches have a sort of inferiority complex. Um, and now, I mean, I don't know, Charles, I don't know what, what church you go to. I'm not sure what your experience has been in that regard. Um, but um, in my experience with the people that, I'm, that, that, I, that I roll with here, um, I wouldn't say it's a widespread issue. Um, I think to a great degree, though, Charles, Christianity is still relatively a new idea in Africa. And I say relatively new because to a great degree, I, I think a Christian worldview is yet to be propagated um, very widely. Um, I think the gospel has been in Africa for a while, 
Um, but I think the implications of the gospel, people really living out a Christian worldview um, is, is, is really lacking um, in that sense. And in that sense, the Western world tends to be more developed, which is why you have uh, more theological writers uh, writing Christian books coming from the West um, rather than uh, rather than here in um, rather than here in Africa. But I think that's changing. And I think as Christians embrace a Christian worldview, as Christians begin to to wake up to the idea that we're made in the image of God, um, we can um, we can really rise above that. Um, but you know that that solution is found in God's word. It's it's, it's not found in uh, trying to divest of um, of Western ideas. Not at all. Yeah, Sam. I don't I know if there's anything the, else you want to say to that. Yeah, I think um, you know. I know some people would say that. And I know it was said in the comment section that yes, we do. Uh, you know, we would recognize post colonial post colonial. Uh, thinkers or people who are influenced by postcolonialism would say that, yes, we agree that, um, you know, African dictators are all wrong and all of that. But in so many words, either saying it explicitly or implicitly. Yeah. And oftentimes it's very explicit. They would say, but the reason for that is mm -hmm. because of the West. That if it wasn't for the West, you wouldn't have Africa the way it is, or you wouldn't have African dictators. Well, that's actually a major problem theologically in so many ways, which I'll get to in a second. But even historically, that's not really so true. As you said, you had oppression in Africa well before uh, the Europeans showed up. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a reason for that, which I'll get to in the future. Right. Um, or, I mean, in the same thing. But it's a similar line of thinking as when people say that, well, Black and Black crime, well, that's only happening because of white supremacy you know, the, the high uh, rates of abortion, it's only happening because yeah. of white supremacy. Yeah. Um, in, in Cuba, the, re the only reason why the Cuban regime hasn't been that helpful is yeah. because the West is not giving them proper aid. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why, um, yeah. you know, so it, there's always an excuse, it always goes back to something else, which mm -hmm. essentially says, that we seem to believe that there is no devil except for the white man being a devil, essentially, or the Western world being a devil. That the great tempter, the great tempter of the world, is always a white person or um, a, a white nation. But yeah. let's go even before that: the slave trade. Well, we don't realize that the people who actually, especially in Ghana, yeah, because Ghana is one of the first places where you had the slave trade, at least the Atlantic slave trade, happening. Yeah. It wasn't the Europeans. I didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't kidnapping. It wasn't forced. It was actually the African chiefs oh, yeah. trading. They're the ones that offered. They offered slaves for rum and for myrrh. And even more than that, once Britain um, uh, abolished the slave trade in the early 19th century, it was so bad. The African chiefs had been had become so wealthy and so and so prosperous from um, from the uh, slave trade that the British army actually had to go to war with some African chiefs to stop them from the slave trade. That's how, that's how uh, um, firmly many African groups loved slavery. Yeah. It was there well before that, right? Yeah. So we can acknowledge absolutely the colonial powers were evil in so many ways. I've read a lot of their, their words about Africans being savages and being all that. But you know what? The Fontes, I'm a Fonte, and the Ashantis, we were calling each other savages and other evil words before the white man showed up as well. Mm. I mentioned that I'll mention something later on to address all of this. Here's the issue. We have to understand that there is something called human nature, a sinful nature, an original sin, that the reason why people do what they do isn't because of other people. We yeah. do what we do because we are evil people that need to repent and obey God. The reasons why Africans do what we do isn't because of the white man, it's because of our own sinful nature. The reason why white people do what they do is because of their own sinful nature. We are all fallen, we all fall short of the glory of God and we need to repent. Yeah. So I completely understand that of course, Colonialism would have an influence on so many of us. I understand that. Yeah. Nevertheless, so-called influence isn't the basis 
for why we do what we do. And we will not stop it if we do not first stop what we are doing ourselves. So let's address the issues now. Yeah, we can address how possibly, you know, colonialism may have influenced Africans. We can, we can address that. Um, and we have in certain certain ways here. But the real issue right now is babies are being murdered by Africans. Babies are being murdered by their mothers and their fathers and African doctors. Uh, with the help of the West, absolutely. And I've written against that, and that's wrong. But you know what? The West cannot force that on us. We do it ourselves. And we need to repent and obey God. Absolutely. And just giving you an example, um, you know, Zambia legalized abortion in 1972, which was um, about a year before it was, it was legalized in, in the United States, right? Planned Parenthood has been around here legally a lot longer than it has been in say a lot longer at least a year longer than it was in um in the united states um so you do see um um a eugenics project even in africa and and, and to the degree to which we can call that oppressive it absolutely is and we should be addressing that um, but these tend to be the issues that are swept under the rug these are the issues that um no one really um wants to confront um and, and on that note sam um, I, I think it's important uh, to also understand that our unity and true unity has to be based on truth. Um, and, and, and truth is, is found in, in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. I think what these kinds of ideologies have done is that it's, it's, it's caused a lot of division, um, is that we, uh, we tend to see differences in the color of skin as a reason for why we can't get along, right? This isn't, this isn't fundamentally an issue be between black people and white people. This is fundamentally an issue between sinful people and a holy and righteous God. Um, and as we are reconciled to him, um, we then are reconciled to each other um, in unity. Um, Ephesians 2 uh, verse 10 going on, uh, wonderfully speaks about the unity that we have in Christ that isn't based on um, uh, on color, right? It, it's based on the fact that we are one in Jesus Christ. Um, and so th that's really what we need. The kind of unity that we need is the unity that lies in Christ and, and in Christ alone. So I don't know if that's something you want to speak to, brother. Um, I don't know how I can even uh, add more words to what you said. I completely agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, Sam, just, just in conclusion, uh, we kind of have gone on for a little while. I understand that there's so much more uh, we could say, but I think this, um, this must suffice for now. Um, and perhaps in the future, we can, we can pick this up again. Um, but, Sam, just kind of give us some of your closing thoughts. What, what are some things that we can, we can leave with? Um, it's hard to summarize all of that in a uh, short... Um... Um, I guess, to, yeah, I, so I guess what I would say is, as, as I said earlier, is that indeed white people do not have a monopoly of truth, of course, in the same way Africans do not have a monopoly on truth. Our culture, our history doesn't, um, you know, um, there's a lot of God's common grace within that, but we don't shape truth. Uh, only God does. God is the truth. Um, you know, the word of God is truth. So let us commit ourselves to that. I think all these ideologies, um, you know, God calls us to uh, destroy these arguments and then to hold all thoughts captive to Christ. That is really what it comes down to. We want to obey God. We want to obey Christ. We want to obey Christ in how we think. We want to obey Christ in, of course, what we do. Yeah. Um, so let us let us commit to that. And look, we are called to be to make disciples of the nations, and uh, we can only do that if we are teaching the gospel and then living worthy of the gospel, and then we are, uh, we are hating evil, loving good and establishing justice in the courts. So we absolutely want justice. Um, true repentance should lead to a desire for justice. Um, and yet not everyone in the world is gonna be a Christian. And yet, if we Christians are choosing to obey God faithfully, we can be the light of the world in leading them into coming to justice. That's what's happened um, in um, every part of the world where you've had 
um, a, a, a commitment, not a perfect commitment, but a commitment to justice. It's yeah. been Christians who have been, even in, even if, no matter how small they might be, because in, even in America, Americans, uh, America is founding principles are probably the greatest example of um, you know Christian principles uh, in a nation. Not all of them were Christians. Uh, actually, not even all the founding fathers were Christians. Actually, very few of them were, but they had been raised to understand Christian theology and they had a respect for it. And that respect for it has led to a nation that for so long um, you know, has produced um, some of the greatest um, evidence of God's providence and grace being in America. Um, so um, anyway, so all that to say that let's be a lot of the world and let's um, reject these things and obey God. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, um, ultimately, I, I pray that each and every one of us um, turn to God, um, turn to him, um, look, look to him for answers, look to him for truth. Um, it is my prayer that um, even the church will find confidence in the fact that God is and God has spoken. And even on, on tough issues like this, um, we can find answers and we can still live faithfully um, as light bearers in a dark world because God is and God has spoken. Um, it, it's on us to, to obey. Um, it's on us to simply believe uh, what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us. It's, it's on us to believe um, that, that his word truly is sufficient um, to deal with these matters at hand. Um, so yeah, um, I just, I just want to say thank you to everyone who, who's joined us. Um, I understand that there was um, a, lot to, a lot to get through and a, a lot to work through. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully we'll pick this up again sometime in the future. Um, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I don't know if you have to leave right away. I don't know what Joe is saying, but I know we have people who might have questions. Is that why Joe is? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if you. If, well, I don't know if the next you have to go right away. But if you don't no, have let, to go right away, no, let, let's, let's do it, man. I got. Time. I've got some time. I've got some time. Let's do this. Yeah. Maybe we can keep yeah. it going. Maybe for well, four o'clock my, my time. So maybe twenty-three minutes. Of, yeah. That's um, good. Questions. That's good. Yeah. So um, I appreciate. Uh, uh, you brothers' conversation. Uh, I just have just a small, um, a small addition. Um, is that a lot of folks uh, don't want to use the Bible uh, for for reconciliation because uh, the Bible actually reconciles. Um, and and I think for many people. Uh, and it's puzzling because you know you think that Christians would um, you know would would uh, endeavor or even eagerly um, accept Jesus as the only uh, solution. The gospel is the only solution to uh, racial tensions, to the critical race theories, and, and, and all that stuff. But you 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 see that uh, Christians rather employ world means uh, to, to solve sin issues. Uh, it's puzzling. So, um, and don't say that, you know, we, this is the time for us to stand on the scriptures and to stand on the efficiency of scripture, the inerrancy of scripture, um, you know, the, yeah, and the efficacy of scripture because um, outside the scripture, is we cannot solve or, or come to a conclusion. And as Samuel said, uh, we are sinners, brother. I am, I am an oppressor as well. <laughs> Where I am, I'm an oppressor. Uh, one way or the other, someone is being oppressed by me. And so, um, you know, we, we just need to look at these things um, from a scriptural perspective. That's, that's all I have to say, brothers. Thank you so much. I appreciate the conversation. Looking forward to more and doing more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, brother, I thank you, man, for what you said. And if I understand your question properly, um, I think you mentioned at uh, one point, why is it that some people do not want to use the Bible as the source for reconciliation? Well, I think it's because they realize that 
the kind of reconciliation they want is in the one that the Bible calls for, is actually the one that the Bible speaks against. Um, I've, I've said many times, and I'm surprised by how much it surprises people when I say this, but that there is no need for reconciliation. There isn't. Um, Ephesians 2 has already said that Christ has reconciled all people Amen. who love God to himself. It's yeah. already done. Christ is the reconciler. No white person, no British person who, you know, because uh, Britain colonized Ghana, no white person or British person needs to come and reconcile, you know, uh, with me. Um, that's not, or one, if they're a Christian, we are already reconciled. We simply need to live like it. Ephesians 3, 4, and 5, and I think 6 as well, if it goes to 6, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting uh, where the chapter ends. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, where the book ends. But it's all about living worthy of that reconciliation we have in Christ. Now, individuals can reconcile with each other when you when an individual has sinned against you, but people cannot a people cannot sin against an individual necessarily. Um, with that being said, I think for unbelievers though, um, where they don't have their reconciliation, honestly, they will always be at war with each other. Yeah, there is going to be there's always going to be partiality. There's always going to be an enmity because they are lost. They don't see the light. They're in the dark and they're just swinging their swords wherever they can. Uh, and that will continue until Christ himself ends all injustice and sin. Um, so, you know, so yeah. So hopefully I'm answering your question there, but I think um, that's what immediately comes to, uh, comes to mind. Yeah, well spoken, Sam, well spoken. Um, I think Charles had had a question and he was asking if, if he could ask it verbally, I believe. Um, Charles, go ahead. Oh. Oh, yeah, hi guys. I hope I'll be clear because my internet had issues. Huh? Yeah, so um, actually, I, I don't even know how to articulate the question because it's so multifaceted. And But let, let me, because um, I, I feel that the critical race theory discussion is like a red herring. And, and, and by red herring, I mean, it prevents us from discussing what we actually need to discuss. And, and um, but with that said, I'm actually glad that we are all Africans here discussing this, but what I'm trying to drive at is when, when we look at Africa, so with my Bible open, and when I look at Africa, there is a problem and all of us know there's a problem. And, and so like, I think those of us like me who will be accused of being critical race theorists, we are just trying to see how can we change things? Cause sometimes it's frustrating. Like, and, and let's just talk about, let's be practical. Like it's very frustrating when you believe that the Lord is sovereign and he's working everything according to the counsel of his will, but and at the same time, you feel like everyone else who is not African is having it easier in the world than you. And then, and then when you take into consideration the historical realities, and all you are asking is that people just talk with you about how can you process all this. And then when you try to have the discussion, you are labeled a critical race theorist, and you are told to shut up. And, and so... The question is a bit multifaceted because I feel it prevents us from having conversations so such that I might be labeled woke and I wouldn't even take that label. But those who would label me woke would prevent me from having a conversation with a so-called conservative. And so we will never be able to come up with real problems in, in the continent that seem to be peculiar to the continent regardless of whether you are an African humanist or African reformed. And so like, I, I guess I will only ask this one question, like how can we better model conversations such that the so-called critical race theorist African and the so-called conservative African can be able to discuss how we can move forward such that we don't feel as if we are cursed. Because as much as we believe our, our theology says we are not cursed, it feels like we are, and we are not allowed to have the conversation. And, and I think that that's what frustrates people. That's why people go to the social justice bandwagon. I, I just want you guys to understand 
where I am coming from. It's, it's not that I don't believe the gospel is that, in fact, it's the gospel propels me to have this conversation. So I, I, I hope you're understanding what I'm saying so that nobody strawmans me that I, I don't believe the gospel is enough, you know, cause, cause that's strong. Okay, I don't know. I guess he said that uh, he was having some, in, yeah. some, uh, yeah, I would, if you don't mind, I would really, really continues like. Along. So, so I hope at least I stood the question. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I just so, muted myself. Oh yeah. But, yeah. Go for it, Sam. Um, if I could, yeah. Okay. Um, I appreciate you um, coming to uh, this, uh, this conversation, knowing that you're probably in a minority of, um, you know, your thinking here. And I, and I generally appreciate that. And yet I'm going to answer your question very firmly. Um, you know, speaking about having good conversations without straw manning each other, brother, I think you're guilty of that. Um, you know, in the comment section, you've been talking about how come are we not having the talk that we really should have, where then you're dictating what you think we should be saying instead of what we we promoted this conversation as being. Um, I have no problem talking to you, which is why I'm answering your question. But you've, I think, in this case, have not handled yourself well in terms of how to address this issue. Um, you mentioned that this whole talk is a red herring, which is really an accusation because red herring means that we are intentionally trying to distract from uh, what we should really be addressing. So that is also not a right way to go about having a, a conversation. Um, you know, we we are addressing this. You mentioned that this is all a straw man. Well, in critical race, the, sorry, it, 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 around. No, 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 I'm not saying that you're being disrespectful. No, I'm just saying that I just disagree with what you were saying, no. But um, I think, you know, it, it's extremely dangerous. Um, I think um, it's it's also not right uh, to be saying that, well, honestly, okay, you know what, I, I'll, I'll take it back. And I don't mean this as a, I don't mean this as a uh, harsh word against you. I would say that while I know your attitude is not to be disrespectful, I think the, the word, I wouldn't use the word disrespectful, but I would say that the word, um, well, the words you're saying that we are not having the real conversation, that we are essentially distracting from the real conversation is unkind because it, it comes with an assumption against us and perhaps our motives. Uh, because while critical race theory really is an issue within the church, I can tell you it's destroying people, it's destroying many church conversations. The fact that people have been said unkind words about you is wrong. I don't think that anyone should tell you that you are not in the faith. Um, you are not in the faith because of critical race theory. But I will say that if you, I don't know if you embrace critical race theory, but if someone does embrace critical race theory, um, they are aligning with something that is against the gospel, which is a major problem. But going to other things that you were saying as well too. Um, well, you mentioned that, you know, you, you know, here you are in, in Africa, many people are struggling while across the world, many are not. Well. Um, that in of itself, I think, shows a false assumption, because within the context of what you were saying, you seem to be saying that means there's something wrong. Well, not really. Um, so being that I'm in Canada, um, you know, as an average, you know, I'm a, I'm not wealthy by any means, but the average person in Canada is significantly more wealthy than the average person in Africa. Does that mean that I'm doing something wrong? No. Even in Africa, you have certain areas in Africa where you have people who are significantly wealthier than others or who are doing better than others. Does that mean anything? No. Uh, we, we define evil by intent and actions, not by outcome. All right. And I think that is the concern here, which is why, um, you know, again, I don't know you have not, I don't know your reasoning, a lot of your arguments, but that kind of thinking is, um, is deeply, again, I don't know your thinking, but it would not surprise me if you were a critical race theorist. I, I don't know, because that kind of thinking by comparison, by saying, well, some people are doing this poorly, some people are doing this well, and therefore that means there has to be a problem is from postmodernism and Marxism and critical race theory. And I think that's wrong uh, because look, I always mention this, you have the parable of talents, which is about the gospel and the kingdom of God. But within there, we see um, um, certain principles that we need to understand, right? In the parable of talents, you have 
the the, uh, the owner giving his servants three different servants. It gives it gives one five talents. It gives one two talents. It gives another one one talent. At the end, the two the first two double their talents, and the other one does not. He, they, he just buries his talents, and then he accuses his master of being of or the owner of, of uh, being the one who uh, who has poor character. I mean, um, your point. Someone said it was valid. I honestly don't. I don't. I didn't see any valid arguments there. That's not to disrespect you. I just didn't think that um, it was it was right um, based on the arguments that you were making. Now again, if anyone, uh, now I have no I have no problem calling someone a critical race theorist if their arguments are influenced by critical race theory or if they are critical race theories. Nevertheless, I also don't want someone being falsely labeled as such if they are not. Um, there are many people out there who would say they are not critical race theorists when they still are teaching critical race theory. So for example, uh, Ibrahim Kendi claims he's not a critical race theorist, but he's a critical race theorist. He's lying about that. That doesn't mean that everyone else is lying about it when they say that they're not critical race theorists. I'm just saying that it, it's possible that some people are right in calling others critical race theorists when sometimes they're also wrong and it's slander as well. So it depends on the context. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but I, I hope that I did. Yeah, and uh, just to add to that, Sam, and that's, I, think, I think you've really touched on this really well. Um, there's a lot of ideas that people come across and buy into without even knowing that they have, right? Um, um, that that happens all the time, which is why I can agree with Sam saying, um, I think sometimes the labels can be helpful um, in categorizing people a certain way. Um, um, the, 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 tr the truth of the matter is this kind of ideology is, is in the water today. Um, it's, I'd say, um, the, the commonly accepted idea, um, and and so it's it's it, it's not a a way to slander someone. I think it's it's it it just really is what it is. Um, also, I think the idea that black people um, or maybe Africans um, have have a unique experience of oppression. Um, I'll say this, uh, the, the Hebrews back in the Bible uh, who <laughs> had to endure slavery and who through the centuries went through different kinds of, uh, different kinds of problems, different kinds of issues. Um, uh, they were colonialized as well. Um, they've been through it. Uh, you, you see how Jews just in the last century um, have, have been greatly oppressed. Um, and interestingly enough, by, by people who held to, to Marxist ideas. Um, so if we wanna if we wanna play the card of who's more oppressed than, than the other, uh, we could run in circles all day, man. Uh, we really could. Um, but the reality of the situation is um, um, we, we have a God, um, we have a hope, um, and we need to find confidence in that. Um, and we also need to do our bits in standing up to ideologies like this that are, are harmful to that truth, that uh, undermine the gospel. Um, we're called to defend our faith as Christians, and that's why we must speak out against these things very directly. I mean, as Sam said, critical race theory um, and all its friends are a poison in the church, a big poison in the church that has caused a division um, of, uh, of a massive order. Um, you, you see how this push towards equality of outcomes has seeped into the church in even allowing female preachers. We see this as a, as a big problem today. Um, so you see how feminism in that regard, um, which by the way is a type of critical theory, um, is, is a prevalent problem in our society and in the church today. Um, to the degree to which we continue to hold some of these ideas. Um, we are unable to be faithful to Christ in the way that he has called us to be faithful, in the way that he has called us to serve him and in the way that he's called us um, to, serve, to serve others. Um, so once again, I mean, the critical theorists will tell you what the problem is. They'll, they'll tell you that the big problem in society are power imbalances, um, are, are injustices. Now, now that, that's sort of superficial in the sense that as, as Christians, we know what the real problem is. We know what the, uh, the, the fundamental issue is. And uh, we also have uh, the true answer. Um, we, we have the true hope to man's uh, greatest need. 
Um, and so um, well, what Sam and I were really trying to do here was to, was to help people, help Christians, help the church, uh, be able to discern what some of these issues are, um, how they stand against uh, biblical truths, and hopefully equipping believers with the, with the ability to stand for the truth against these very prevalent um, ideologies. Um, I understand that there's a lot more we could say, but um, with, with the time that we were given, uh, what we've tried to do is remain faithful to what God has, has said in his word um, and uh, to, to, to analyze ideologies that are contrary um, to, um, to his word. So yeah, Sam, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say to that, but but yeah, I did see a, a couple more raised hands, so I want to I want to get to those. Um, yeah, um, Isaac, Isaac Pinto, why don't you ask your question, brother? Go ahead. Thanks, guys. It's been uh, I think definitely a relevant uh, topic for today. My question is. Um, just your thoughts on regarding uh, post-colonialism. Uh, we, uh, our church here in, in South Africa, at one point, uh, you know, someone was saying that we were too colonial. Uh, you know, if we if we uh, sing hymns or or um, and things like that, we have over thirty different uh, nationalities in in our church, and obviously we can't. Uh, seeing in, in every way, but one, once we kind of confronted the, the, we think that there was some root of, of you know, whether you want to call it CRT or, or post-colonialism, whatever it was, they're saying, no, no, uh, you, you guys are not, uh, you're not being contextual enough uh, here. So just wanted to hear uh, your guys thoughts on that and in, in responding to that. Thanks. Sam, go for it. Um, if I understand the question properly, it's really about, I think, um, his church being accused of colonialism because of uh, the style of worship and uh, things like that. Um, well, one, that person would need to repent. And, and this is the issue here, right? I think, um, in the same way that uh, oftentimes people, you know, look, I don't want anyone, well, okay, before I even say that, sorry, I, I won't be very short here, but, you know, we don't want to label, falsely label anyone, but we also need to accurately label things. Uh, accurately label someone, even if it offends them, it's not a slander, um, it is just the truth. Um, but in the same way too, that if, if a church believed that, um, you know, that I'm trying to figure out how to, okay, well, maybe I'll mention that later on. When it comes to the hymns, churches do not need to sing um, the traditional hymns. We don't need to do that. There are different ways of singing good theology without it being coming from Western writers. Well, but the problem is that I don't know if any other um, I don't know of any non-Western um, writer who has at least more than just one song or two having truly sound good theology in hymns. It's very rare uh, because there are certain things as, um, you know, Western thinking, um, you know, which, or I shouldn't say Western thinking, but ideas that came out of the West that are good, or at least things that came out of the West that are good. The same way you have things that came out of Africa that are really good. Uh, when it comes to this, because the so-called European church, though I hate that, but you know, like Christians in, in Europe have had a long, long history, longer than Africans have. I know obviously you have St. Augustine and you have other guys, but there was a huge break with a lot of influence um, of Christianity coming from Africa. Um, nevertheless, I'm taking too long, but this answers the question very, um, very quickly. Yeah, I know. I just mentioned that, Charles. I had a feeling you'd mentioned that, which is why I said it very quickly. I know that. Um, but um, the point is, is that I think the reason why people sing songs from the West isn't because they believe that the West is better. 
it's because those songs just happen to be the better songs. The same way, the you know, uh, speaking of Augustine, the same way that the most influential um, early church leader is Augustine, doesn't mean that we believe that Africans have a greater, um, um, you know, uh, are, are, we don't think that Africans are better than non-Africans, right? It just happens to be that Augustine is just the best thinker from that era that still ended up influencing the, the Reformation and everything else. So forgive me if I'm not answering the question properly, but I think that person needs to repent because it's a false accusation and it's wrong. Um, but it's absolutely not wrong to sing those hymns at all because really across Africa, everyone does. It's only more recently that we, it, you know, people have been accused of being colonial by um, singing those hymns. Um, let, let, let's move to, I see someone's name here, AK. I'm not sure who like, the full name is there, uh, but you've got a question and then we'll take the last question yeah. from um, Elvia Torres Moraes. I hope I'm saying that correctly, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think those will be the last two questions we take. Go right. ahead, AK. Okay, Thank, thanks for a good uh, discussion, guys. I think my point would um, be maybe similar to what I just, Isaac just spoke about. So one thing that I think um, has been helpful uh, from the you know, area where I am um, has been dealing with some of these um, issues from a local church where there are ideologies that are out there and you wanna make sure that you, you know, the, the people in the church are actually just guided and you help them and you keep them to be able to be able to differentiate, which is good. And that's what um, we should be doing, obviously, by the word of God, right? Um, but one of the things that happened um, in our church, for example, was when it comes to songs and the singing of songs, where there's always been, you know, yes, it's hymns that were sung. And actually coming even from the leadership of the church, which was, you know, you would say, you know, white, um, recognizing that the, you know, the demographics there in the church, things are changing. You're having a lot of um, black people coming into the church and the leadership deliberately took the decision to say, we need to really be able to accommodate and help people worship God better in the way that they would know how and how God has made them and celebrate you know, the way they are. And one of those things was to say, is there anyone who knows, you know, a Swahili song or this song or that song that can be incorporated into the number of songs that are sung to help people out, right? And then that happened. But, you know, actually one of the people who was like, you know, part of the leadership, they not a singer, not, but to go into the work of translating songs, some of the English songs, so that they can be incorporated to try and actually just help the church to saying, we want to be, you know, loving to everyone and everyone is to see that. Even as we say, everyone is made in the image of God and it's for one to actually just, and it's not about the people, but to saying, I want to help them worship God better because some of them are not even good English speakers. But even if they do not get everything from the sermon, but they would come out of this having sung songs and spoken truth, you know, in song to God, you know, and speaking even into their heart, reminding themselves of the glory of God, right? And so when that happens, and that's why when, you know, it's done even in the context of the local church, it helps to protect and to do it not, you know, in a way of fighting because it can't, the problem is when it's a matter of fighting and we're causing fights, but it's with harmony. The main thing and the point that you guys hit was it's about the truth of Christ and we want Christ to be exalted in the people's lives. Yes, there are, might be issues that are there, but it's just saying, let's, let's, let's try and understand what does the Bible say? And then what can we do looking at what we know from the Bible? And, we, you know, and, and it's starting with the people. One thing that, and I'm saying this because it was helpful in our church because there's still conversations that happen, but within the flock, the leadership has been very careful to, try and lead and even there be some individuals who might have certain sort of like ideas but to actually just lovingly come alongside says let's talk about it brother what do you say let's talk about this and and being able to understand some of these and i mean yeah i can give a lot of other examples but 
what has helped was to say, understanding the unity we have in Christ forces us, should make us work together to love one another, to understand that even if you are on the wrong, I'm, my, my goal is to love you and say, brother, Christ has to be honored. Whether you are on the black side, the white side, the gray side, it doesn't matter. Christ is the center. And we all need to come back to that. And now we deal with everything. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think sometimes there can be this um, idea that is prevalent in critical theory, um, that epistemology, which is basically how we know things, knowledge and how we know things, um, is dictated by, um, by whoever is the power, uh, whoever is really in control, whoever is seen to be, um, in very specific terms, the oppressor in, um, in a society. Um, and I think, I think it's done damage to, to what we think of truth. And so now we think ideas like diversity and representation are more important than truth. Um, and we think that unity is found in representation um, when, and often at the expense of truth. Um, so I, I, think it's, I think it's very important to, uh, to understand that the most unifying thing in that sense is truth. Um, therefore, um, even if a certain song is, is in a different language, if it communicates truth, it's great. Um, it doesn't matter if it's another language, if it's true, um, it must prevail um, over, let's say, a song that is poorly written with bad theology, but is in a language of someone who feels they need to be represented, you know? Uh, so truth must take precedence over diversity or even representation. All right, Sam, I don't know if you want to say anything to that, but um, we can then move uh, where, especially in the context where you have, um, say, you know, a church in Africa, where if it's a, as you were saying, AK, I think, that if most of the leaders are white uh, or European, and then uh, a lot of the members are Africans and they, they don't speak English as well as, uh, or they don't speak the hymns as well, so they don't speak the English as well, mean they don't understand maybe the lyrics as well. Well, yeah, translating them into the, the native language is, is fantastic because again, it's not the language that matters, it's the message, it's the truth. It's the, um, you know, it's, it's the lyrics. So I think that's good, that's very, very important. The danger though, the, the danger there though is not, if a church fails to recognize that, it's not sinful, it's not colonial, it's not oppressive. They just didn't know that. It's not wrong, right? Sometimes that's the issue here. We think everything is either evil or righteous. There are a number of things where it just matters in the context. It's the heart that deals with these issues. So I'm not saying AK is saying that. I know you're not saying that. But that um, to deal with what I think Isaac was saying earlier, for someone to just come out and say you're being colonial, that's just, that's, that's evil. And that person needs to repent. Um, but to say, hey, I think it could be better if you change this, that's, that's great, we want that. And if they say no, that's okay too, depending on the reasons why. So I think uh, that's why we just need to all consider the other person as more significant than ourselves. But that's the failure here. We're not obeying the Bible. We're all just trying to seek our own way. Lennox, I know you're back. Sorry, uh, continue what you were saying. No, that, that's all good. I, I think I just wanted you to come in there. Um, I think Alvia Torres Morales had a question. I don't know if she's asked her question already, um, but if not, um, go ahead. Hi, Lennox so, um, and Samuel. Yeah, I, more than a question, I had just a, a comment overall about the, the conversation. Um, I, I grew up in, Me in Mexico, that's where I, I was born. So, and recently I have followed some other people in Latin America, I think this issue is, is, is global, like definitely, it's not about a specific country or a continent. I have had multiple, um, like I said, uh, watch different videos from different people from Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, um, Mexico itself. So, and, and it's the same, the same issues. It's postmodernism, it's all these ideal ideas that they are, even infiltrating all the all the all, it's a society itself, the the politics. So um, 
and, and it's definitely very sad, right? So then we to see again that the same uh, tendencies that other countries have follow. Um, again, different things with, um, again, the white man is the, is, is the reason of all the problems that happen, right? So all the in, in, in our, I would say in our case, uh, yeah, I don't live in Mexico anymore, but in that case, so asking uh, the Spanish uh, or the Spain um, for, for forgiveness because of the colonialism that they impose in, in, in Mexico. Like I remember when I became a Christian, so and I recall that in one of the preachings or our pastor, he said that he that this and that was many years ago it wasn't even recent right so that was like 12 13 years ago and he said when he's preaching that he was if if any if if every if anything he was grateful that those those people the the white men brought the christianity to 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 america and he said because before the, the white man was here. Um, all the tribes and everybody was 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 wild. They were colonializing each other. They were um, engaging in war and and giving offerings, <laughs> sacrifices to to their gods, right? So I think it, it, when you put it that way, so then myself, which I am, like I said, I believe in Jesus. I believe in, in Christ. Um, so I find it myself. In agreement with that, it didn't make much of an impact at that time. It makes sense, but it didn't make of an impact like it is today for me. That that comment that he made because it is um, something that, if anything, again, um, um, I know, like I said, it was in the past. In no country is perfect. Everybody has um, their their, their, their issues right so but i think overall i've seen the same the same issues right now the division with the indigenous people in mexico with this and that and in the divisive right that the left is basically addressing the same with the same tactics tactics in 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 united states probably in africa or in canada which that's where i live now so you see the same the same thing. So then this kind of a conversations that you have in, in Samuel, I think that they're very, very helpful and and I really like yeah, so I think it is the same the, the same issues that we have today. So in other places where there was no issues, right? And now there is issues. I completely agree. Um, that's the issue with all of this. If you embrace all of this, well, you're gonna no one, no one, no one is innocent. Uh, the indigenous people anywhere, they were also oppressing other indigenous groups as well. Um, you know, even in Ghana, um, you might have the Ashantis, which is a tribal group in Ghana, complaining about the colonial, because the Ashantis were the dominant tribe in Ghana before the Britain came and took over. Well, the Ashantis were oppressing my people, and my people were oppressing other people too. So it's like, and that's the reality of human nature. We are all sinful. So we need to um, just all realize, and again, some, for some people it might offend them, but it's, this is really about the gospel and all of us repenting and letting the gospel and then sharing the message of Jesus Christ across the world, including what he says about justice. Um, so if you don't deal with that, if we're all just going to be bitter against how we were supposedly oppressed, and also here's, here's a reality, I was not oppressed by white people. My, my people were. And even then, it wasn't white people who oppressed them, it was humans who oppressed them. Um, I don't care what color they were, they were just oppressive people. Um, I was not oppressed. Um, it was my distant relatives or my my forefathers who were who were oppressed. Uh, All right, brother, I think that's where we'll call it a day. Um, yeah, just thank you to everyone who's, who's joined us. This has been amazing. I mean, it's been pretty awesome getting people from across the world um, listening to this um maybe maybe sometime in the future sam and i will do another one of these um but just just thank you thank you so much it's 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 wonderful to see um each and every every one of you um sam um you, you open for us in prayer i don't mind if i just ask you to close for us in prayer and then we can we can call this a night yeah uh again thank you all for uh joining us guys i know that's two hours of your time um so we appreciate it um, so yeah, now I'll pray to end it.
Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Father, we thank you for uh, enabling us to be able to speak. Um, you know, again, while we're all in different spaces, uh, we are, you know, it's only by your grace um, and your will that you allow us to talk and hopefully to uh, speak, um, you know, your truth, to, to teach biblical truth and um, to, um, to destroy some of these arguments that are destroying people and destroying relationships, destroying churches, destroying uh, friendships and marriages. And Father, let us just hold firmly to what we have learned in your scriptures. Uh, let us remember that all scripture is sufficient and is profitable for teaching um, against all unrighteousness and that it makes, it makes us equipped for every good work in Christ. Um, people are radically depraved and uh, there are people dying, millions of people, billions of people are dying and they're going to hell, Father. Let us understand what is of first importance and that is the gospel, that we are all sinners. That when we stand before God, uh, we are going to answer for our sins, uh, not people's sins against us, for our sins, that every thought and deed we will have to give an account. And yet, Father, we know that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, so that if we believe him and receive him in faith, we are justified according to his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection and his ascension and in his, his return um, soon. So Father, we pray that we would hold fast to your gospel, that we would love your gospel and that we would live uh, worthy of the gospel uh, in front of all men so they would see our works and glorify our Father in heaven. In Christ I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, hopefully, we'll see you again. Muchas gracias. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. <laughs> everyone, have a good day. And for those who, you know, it's nighttime like me, have a great night. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, bye, guys. Thank you all.